Hey, thanks for tuning in to Interactive Indies, a bi-weekly community podcast featuring stories from game developers and other creative individuals. Uh, if you'd like to support us as we continue to grow the podcast within the community, uh, please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash interactive indie. You can also support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel uh, by searching Interactive Indie and helping us reach our first 100 subscribers. All the links will be provided in the description below. So on today's episode, I have a conversation with guest Corey King. Corey is an international award-winning storyteller, game developer, and producer with experience in building mobile, augmented reality, and virtual reality games through his company Zenfry, which he co-founded with his wife Danielle. Based in Winnipeg, Corey was the 2016 recipient of the Future Leaders of Manitoba Award and named one of CBC Manitoba's Future 40. Uh, Zenfry's most recent game was also nominated for two Canadian Video Game Awards. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Corey King. Thank you for tuning in to the Interactive Indies Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Voth, and today I have with me a special guest, uh, the first person I ever sat down with in the community, Um, so I'm glad to have him on, Corey King. He is, has a few interesting projects that he's done in the past, and usually what I do is I try and read off bios to introduce the guests, but I feel like it always comes across as a little bit weird, so... I don't know if you can maybe do a better job than I would potentially to explain people. Well, I certainly prefer other people to hype me than me to hype myself. (laughs) That comes off a little... uh... Okay, so you know what? That's actually a good point. So we have... um, Most people would probably know you through Zenfry and certain projects like Clandestine Anomaly. Um, What other sort of projects would people might know you by? Uh, Well, it depends on the community. For the indie community, it probably is mostly clandestine anomaly uh some people might be aware of last taxi that we're working on currently right, 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 right. uh we seem to have gotten quite a bit of notice for the uh morden fossil discovery center app we made uh in collaboration with bitspace um and uh, well actually people don't really know that we're involved and i'm only very tangentially involved in this project but uh we did contribute like some design and art on the uh the VR safety or what's it's not VR safety but it's uh, the safe safe work safe work VR yeah it's like that, that banners was... like well, me and Dan were just driving around Dan from Bitspace were just driving around one day he was helping me like get someplace and there was like one of those electronic banners in the city showing it and that was, yeah. it, that was interesting but uh, so I guess I'm not necessarily known for that and Zenfry had a role in that less so me but uh, yeah I don't know uh, that that's a lot of it I have also um, in the past written i've i was in the comments section like not the comments like writing letters to the editor but commentary section of the free press when i was in university and i wrote right. a lot for the manitoban did some films uh but the indie community probably doesn't know that um and uh i have lots of ideas that i failed to get off the ground uh <laughs> you know because when i started out i i didn't necessarily start out wanting to do clandestine anomaly i, I right. tried to do a game called warp it was also called gravity ball it was a mobile game i've never heard of that one well it's because it's been like never went anywhere and uh (laughs) but uh you know because people say start small you know you should start small it's you shouldn't take on too much but uh being as i was from film i guess because i'm not a cool guy uh who knows what but i wasn't really able to marshal the uh inspire people to work with me uh on on something like that um back in the day you know we had a prototype we had some art and stuff like that but couldn't get off the ground uh and you know i'm a pretty impatient fella so i just went you know screw it basically and i went for what was always the big idea at the time was clandestine Mm -hmm. uh and then we got funding and uh yeah i'm mostly known for that and uh I don't know. I really, I really want to make something good at some point, <laughs> and I'm hoping Last Taxi is that. Um, comparatively, in terms of me being inside the project, things are definitely more. You know, usually as I, I, I have an idea and it's beautiful, and it systematically gets uh, more and more sort of destroyed 
through incompetence right. or who knows what as you go. And I, uh, for this project, the one I'm working on right now, uh, for the first time, it feels like things are actually progressing better. Like I have, a, I have probably the best team I've ever had, and I'm really uh, excited about that. But I still reserve the right f- to totally muck it up. And if I do, I might. I don't know if I have it in me to make another game. Um, I can't just like make make uh, great ideas that are totally ruined over right, and over right, again. Right. Um, so I wanted to take a, a back a little bit and touch and elaborate on kind of the first time that we had met, uh, which was my first introduction to you. Um, I don't know what led up to specifically us meeting at the Starbucks. I don't know if you remember. I think you reached out to me, but that's all I vaguely remember. Yeah, but you remember that interaction oh, in yeah. general. Um, so I was at a point where I was always passionate about games, and I didn't really know what to do. And I was just at that point, I was like reaching out to people. And this was at a point when I wasn't really, I didn't really have anything to offer. Um, so I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't, I guess I just didn't know. Even looking back, I don't, I don't know how things happened. But I remember reaching out to you in some way or another. And uh, we met at a Starbucks. And I remember thinking after the fact, oh, this guy's working on this like cool stuff. I think at the time you were, it was you, you had time. some stuff publicly out there i my office was actually right by uh cordon oh so that's why you met with me because it's convenient and close it was a three minute walk (laughs) uh and i'm slow so um uh yeah we were near like there's the bar italia there we were like you know two doors down from bar italia at the time so we definitely were in production on clandestine probably at the time but that was that game took forever so actually you know what i've never thought to ask you this why did you Make, sit, like sit down with you me. yeah uh you know um, despite i think having a reputation of coming off as kind of like a prickly yeah prick maybe <laughs> can we swear on this podcast uh, yeah um or whatever uh i'm usually pretty open to people to be honest with you like i uh i, I and like i think everyone's worth a shot uh and you never know like i i, I also think um people who uh, are just coming up like I have a lot of time and patience for bringing in interns for working with the Mets school uh, you know when I have done talks I've done them at the Rotary Club career symposium for teenagers basically like people who have a dream and, and don't really know if they can do it that's you know there's there, there's no weird bad blood there's they're not your competitors right. they're just kids who uh, could be trapped in a desk job or some boring god knows what and I think that that's the appropriate time to interfere with people's lives and hmm. give them a little bit of hope. And and honestly, like like nobody knows nobody knows what they're doing. I've known that for a long time. The older I get, the more tragic it becomes that that is the case. Um, and uh, no one gave you know no one in the community really gave me a shot. And I think a lot of them still don't give me a shot. Uh, I don't you know that's if I have a if I have a game that's actually hit maybe. Maybe then uh, uh, <laughs> just people will respect me or feel I'm actually part of the community or whatever. But um, I certainly know, like, when I tried to get clandestine on the ground, like, like I, I built a volunteer team from everywhere but here, basically. Like, and I went to no, like, I'm not going to name names, but, like, I went to everybody, everyone who's a name developer, most of them who are now f- quite successful and, right. I, and reached out for help. Uh, and uh, the polite ones answered my emails or maybe the polite ones didn't answer my emails because ultimately uh, nobody virtually helped me. And I think it was because I'm a film student and I don't know anything about coding and uh, no one wanted to take a chance on me. Uh, but it would be a hypocritical for me to not then think that people in a similar situation are worth my time. Uh, the world is very, um, very closed off. And I think, I think honestly, like, I don't think anything's possible. I think that's naive, but I think a lot is possible. And uh, you don't know what what people are worth until you give them the time. And honestly, it doesn't even matter to me. Like if, if people leave that conversation and they just feel like they have some clarity in their lives, um, that, that's a pretty major thing you can give to a person. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to do it, really. It's interesting... To hear that that kind of more of a negative experience influences you to to then in turn like flip that around and the whole turn it into like a positive through reaching out to yeah, people. I would say the whole you know early years of me doing game dev, me doing clandestine 
was just piss and vinegar and me trying to prove myself honestly uh i've i've not i've never been one who's been given like an easy time like through school or through anything uh but i get there eventually and uh yeah i i came from a place of contempt when i made clandestine so there, and that probably about the, the whole best. about the whole world about like right. my high school teachers about family about all kinds of stuff that i've now gotten over um and uh you know be like you know i'm gonna i gotta prove you guys wrong and also and i think a lot of people in the community would concur that like when we first got the funding uh you know i i really was obnoxious with the press uh but it was out of me being like i really i really would like everyone to be together i would really like to work with everybody i would really but when they all say no then you get some money and that could have been shared you really oh, okay. you want to shine as bright as possible right um because it's like you know trying to you're, you're just trying to disprove people but i've kind of gotten over even ultimately caring about that i would like to make something of substance in my life i right. want to make something that lasts um so under underneath that sort of uh, for lack of a better word resentment there is a desire to contribute and to be a part of that community that i mean potentially sh shuns you i think i think like why waste good talent on bad vibes right you know uh and and i know that that might sound ironic uh you know because i am but i think there's always opportunities i'm always willing to forgive people and i also i also or, or have people forgive me or give people a second shot. Like literally, I just want to make the best stuff possible. And whatever vector that is, like literally people could call me an asshole, but if they produce good work and they get over whatever they think the problem is, I'm, I'm honestly happy to work with pretty much everybody as long as there's a shared vision. Like if everyone thinks that they're the, like the ideas are clashing and it's not like if there's a bad vibe, it's not good to work with people. Uh, if there's animosity, it's not good to work with people. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of parallel universes where maybe I'm cooler or maybe right. <laughs> I come off a little different where uh, great things get to be made that never get to be made because of the universe we seem to be in. And uh, I think that's tragic, but it's unavoidable, you know, and, and, and I do come off very much like um, I'm not the most flexible guy and I'm yeah. aware of that too, you know, like I have certain standards and yeah. then if i get slighted I'm, I'm i'm not like the one to like put my hand out i, I would say though like I, like i would agree with all of that um but i think a lot of times um people will have a preconceived notion about something you're you're mm -hmm. uh, let's take you as an example um and if you kind of take that notion and don't get an opportunity to disprove it or just get to know that person yourself rather than hearing through the grapevine and having this sort of negative connotation be passed mm -hmm. along from this person to this person and to have it unfairly affect this person. You know what I mean? Like, for example, I've gotten to know you myself and like, I understand where some of that stuff is coming from, but even more than that, there's, I think there's a lot more of the positive things that you've mentioned. Like, just wanting to make something great, and um, you know, I think I think that shows. Like when through talking to you and getting to know you, my harshness comes out of a desire for doing great things. And there are obviously people who can make great things in this more congenial, fun, light environment. As I don't know how to do that. I really don't know how to do <laughs> yeah. that. Um, you know, uh, come from discipline. Come from like clarity uh and bust your ass i mean ultimately though like i'm also fine like like i've, I've never i don't cowtail i don't i don't i don't submit like i'm and i'm fine like i'm fine come what may like you know i'm gonna do my thing and i hope someday i make something great and mm -hmm. i'll make it great with people i'll make it great without people or i won't make anything great at all mm -hmm. and does it all even really matter ultimately like take the greatest person you could think of like shakespeare He's been known for 300 years, but does anyone really know Shakespeare? We know, like, the outputs of his work, and we right. re and we recontextualize it every generation. We go, oh, now it means this, now it means this. Oh, uh, you know, because Freud's popular now, we're going to take it from the Oedipal Complex approach and think that uh, Hamlet loved his mother, you know. Uh, and, and so it's like, well, 
if the truth of your art and who you are is distilled through these fragments of things you leave in the world that's then contextualized within the state of the contemporary culture, is anything that you, what you wanted in your work ever really remembered? Are you ever really remembered? It doesn't really matter. I mean, you just hope that you do stuff that will have some kind of an impact to make the world a better place, whether that's very temporal, like when it, when it releases or whether that's later on. And uh, I think even if, I mean, it's naive or ignorant to think it's going to do that, but I think that you need to like guide your life on a quest of maximizing what you can do for the rest of humanity. Right. Um, and uh, being a game dev puts you in an odd situation because you're not exactly curing cancer. Um, so you got to find hopefully other ways. Mm. I, th I think it's unfortunate that that's kind of a situation that you find yourself in um, with regards to the community because, again, not to be too repetitive, but I think uh, there's a lot more to you than kind of sure. what is heard. How much of it is self-inflicted exile? <laughs> right? And, and I'm okay with that. Like my, my, but why, why my, are you okay with that? My, uh, my dating strategy, as crazy as it was, was to chase people off as quickly as possible when there's the lowest emotional baggage and that's the part that makes me understand why some of these things people come over the hill with you when they come over the hill with you you know uh everyone can pretend to be friends in the situation of everyone liking each other it's harder to have some resistance to that relationship get over it mm -hmm. and then have a friendship but i think those friendships and relationships that do experience that early are the ones that last mm -hmm. um and I keep a small circle of, of people who I really, really trust. Okay, um, cool. But I make sure, you know, not that they'll necessarily die for me, but, you know, you never know until the gun's drawn what right. people are going to do. But I want people to be there for the right reasons, you know, mm -hmm. and how do you how do you litmus test if people have the right reasons? Mm -hmm. If you're always just giving out candy and kisses and saying how everyone's so awesome and a sweetheart or whatever it is you're doing... Um, it's hard to know if the people are there because they want to be with you or want to make something with you. Okay. Uh, so hostility comes as a way to, you know, allow sincerity. Right. You know, you get over the, you, you cross over the bridge and uh, you know that the person isn't going to be easily scared off mm. by, you know, because you happen to say something that's currently politically incorrect or who knows what. Yeah. Jeez. Um, so you understand like you're self-aware of where some of these attitudes or some of these opinions rather is a better word are coming from. I mean, I'd say I've thought about it. I'm not really sure that I'm like, what does self-aware mean? I don't know. Right. Like, uh, I see some of it and I don't see some of it. Like it's hard to say, like, I do feel like I'm a guy who walks in the room and is like understood to be eccentric before I like, like quick. Right. Real quick. And I don't know where that, like, event horizon <laughs> is. Right. Uh, and it's endlessly fascinating to me. But I'm also not one who's, like, I just need to collect people. I really, like, like, people are, uh, it takes a lot uh, to deal with people. But my, my, my whole thing is, I think, well, I'm looking to m remove myself more and more in terms of, you know, being some kind of a figure or whatever you know i used to think because i made so many different things my wife and i make books and do all this other stuff that we would need to be one of us she's she's shy uh she doesn't like being in front of the camera right. so it's not like i've been trying to suppress her from from being like in the limelight in terms of the company uh and i honestly don't mind the limelight i kind of like it um but i think i think ultimately like none of it matters and uh what matters is you make something great and and you should be nice to people and certainly I've changed my management style extremely over the years to try to be much more generous, much more giving, make things much more collaborative. But I also think, you know, the goal is to make something great and it doesn't matter whose name's on it. You I know? think people can appreciate that if, if, if you got an opportunity to sort of have a conversation like this with people that maybe um, have a preconceived notion. Like, I, I think when it really comes down to it, you can like you can appreciate that. 
I just wanted to add that I do think that you would be sort of a valuable member of the community. Um, so I would like to, uh, personally, I would like to see you integrated more in that. Yeah. Um, what's, what's difficult for me too, in terms of games generally, to be honest with you is, is this the avenue to maximize the, you know, steering of the ship of humanity in the right direction? Mm -hmm. You know, I only have a certain level of skills, but like, okay, so I become adopted by this community, uh, and then I go make a TV show. Does the community reject me? Because when I first came here, I came from film background, and there was a lot of like, oh, you're the film guy, you're the film guy, and you're like, well, no, I'm I'm trying to make a game, and it's fine. Like like, uh, ha- having happiness, having solidarity, is great, but. You know, my real goals are to build a team who can build games that are great. But ultimately, I don't think the only thing I have to contribute is making games. And that's an, another thing that I wanted to uh, touch on a little bit uh, a little bit later. One other sort of moment um, in time that I remember of you is I went to this. This might have been the second or third time uh, interacting with you. Uh, you had given a presentation at ACI. Okay. It yeah. was it was a retrospective on clandestine anomaly, I believe. It was yep. called the talk was called Perseverance. Yeah. And I remember initially the room was a little bit full. It was like half full, and you started off being super candid, which um, which I connected with because it's like anytime people get up. And they're giving a talk about, oh, this thing that I made is successful. I remember... Well, I don't s- think I ever claimed it was successful. No, no, no. That's, that's what I'm saying. Is that here's this guy that's on the stage. My perception is he should be saying those things. Oh, yeah. But you, you weren't doing that. You were very open, honest, and candid. And I don't know if you can touch on that a little bit about kind of the... the, the, the the aspect of clandestine that didn't go according to plan. Nothing. And, sorry? None of it went according to plan. <laughs> I mean, that thing was supposed to be an MMO where you could build these sci-fi forts over your, you know, to defend your house and then your friends rage you in the night. You know, like, that's what I wanted. I wanted you'd, you'd build, you know, you'd build these towers around your house. You'd defend yourself and then, your, you know, your friends would sneak attack you in the evening. And it was this giant, endless MMO um, that was ultimately about the singularity, which you could never tell by the content of the story, but that thing got re- rewritten so many times. I mean, it, it struggled from the ambition was definitely beyond the budget, definitely beyond the grasp of the team. And uh, I was extremely inexperienced. I was, you know, given a big plate uh, without knowing what what was necessarily the right approach to getting there. And I actually look at what we're accomplishing now on this game. And again, not to say it's going to be good. Referring to Last Taxi. Last Taxi. But even in terms of like art art budget. Yeah. And I, look at, I look at the art that's in Clandestine, and I look at the art that's in Last Taxi, and the budgets are similar, and it just makes that failure feel even greater. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, like, like it, you feel good about it, because you're like, okay, like, I'm not saying I'm a good dev, but I've, I've at least crossed some things off the list. I know what I'm doing better. I know I, I built a better team. Some of it's just luck. Like you find people who synergize more. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and my team is smaller, but it's like its output is way higher. Um, and I don't necessarily know all of the things to do. Like I said, I do lead things differently. Um, and I keep management very, very small. We had like multiple PMs on it. And, you know, at one time, clandestine had 30 people working at the same time. And wow. I would, yeah. Was, I don't think a lot of people, uh, I didn't know well, that. It was, it was stupid. But we, I didn't know that, right? Like, I thought that that was what you're supposed to do. Um, and I was not necessarily being given the best advice. Um, okay. You know, I, I tried to hire people on to make up for my failings. It's not like I went in being like, I've never made a game. I know what I'm doing. Um, but the not knowing what you're doing uh, makes it harder for you to even know if who you're hiring is the right person to hire to guide you through the process. Because you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it's like, but I did hire people in, who were ostensibly more experienced to guide me through the process. But... I mean, it was, it was rough. It was rough. It was like, 
you know, there's a few things in my life that were like really hit me in terms of like struggle. And it was like, my parents got divorced. There's like, I was diagnosed with like a disability. I failed a grade, but like right up top, probably at the very pinnacle was clandestine in terms of it just being like, we almost got destroyed. Like, like we, and we got very lucky and it makes me think a lot about things like, like I'm a not religious person, but I cannot say, I cannot take personal credit for the fact that that thing didn't blow up. I can take personal credit for dispensing with what wasn't working. But had right. I not found talented people who could rebuild, we just would have, the ship would have sank. You know, we were basically on the Titanic and, and uh, you know, I threw everyone overboard, not everyone, but a lot of people overboard saying this, this crew ain't working. And, uh, and uh, I had nobody who even knew how to steer at that point. And mm. if I never found anyone who would steer, we would have been done and like done. Like as much as I'm maybe not the most well liked guy now, I would have been a, a, like a pariah of infinite <laughs> scale if I came out with all this chutzpah and totally, totally shot the sh- shot the ship down, like sank right. it, you know. And we got into we just got a ship mode, and we did by the skin of our teeth. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And uh, I hope it pays off that I learned a lot. It was extremely painful. I had panic attacks constantly, like like debilitating panic attacks, and uh, it was not it was not fun. It was uh, and uh, and for some reason I decided to like go down the exact same process again in terms of how I got it funded and things like that and take another mm-hmm. spin. But um, you know, I don't know that I'm proud of it, but I'm not proud of anything I make ever. So like um, even things that have more closely met the vision you get to the end of it and you're like wow that was how many years of my life and how much mm. of other people's lives you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position by sort of being so open about it why why do you kind of put yourself out there like that like right now right now and during the talk i remember you were saying essentially the same things. well i think that i think the talk was you know tr- attempting to well for one i like it's a small community. People know when uh, expectations of what you, you, you attempted to do don't align with what you ultimately accomplished. There's no point hiding from that. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that openness... I don't know. I, uh, I don't really have any place now for like self-aggrandizement. Um, I usually leave that, again, to the people who introduce me. Let them give the nice bio. Yeah, we won awards. Even Clandestine got nominated for some bizarre... like like two Canadian video game awards and one of them we lost like a Hitman mobile game and like like believe me we weren't there at that award show with mm-hmm. with this level of arrogance like we deserve to be there we generally were like some people obviously were confused to have nom- to have us get nominated <laughs> for that award um and you know and the Ubisoft game was there uh, in terms of like one of their like temple Assassin's Creed games, they weren't in the exact categories as me, but it was almost like having Titanic at the Oscars. It was like they had every single award, and they had tons of their people there, and it was just me and me and my wife in in the seat, and some of my family came and were in the in the bleachers, and like we were just like, well, hey man, like we came out of this crucible, and and uh, we're getting some recognition, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, like try to enjoy it, drink some beer. Uh, have some fun but you know i none of it really means all that much ultimately like awards not awards you know um like in my office space i I intentionally don't like post newspaper clippings from you know we were we were in uh a newspaper called le monde i think i don't know i'm not french but it's a very big paper in france we were in bangkok times but i don't i don't like surround myself with those things like their trophies i i think i think that leads to a an egotistical path and and like the job is to make something great and making something great is hard it's very hard some people it comes naturally to and we have some very brilliant people in our own community who i'm sure it doesn't really come naturally to but who seem to have a very good track record Mm -hmm. um but that's really the goal and and like i don't i don't even really believe in authorship like you put your name on things because you're kind of supposed to but like, I don't really even like like believe that there's any point ultimately in saying this was made by me or that when you watch the you know 
one of the great Pixar films, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Do, do, do you do you care? You know who who wrote it? Probably not. No, you, you care that you love the work. Yeah. And and that's what lasts, and that's what gets interpreted, and and putting yourself as as the face of it, or or even like how do you take credit? There's other people who work on it. The process changes with every person who's involved in it. Like you you still have an overall vision that you're guiding, but how things look change based on who the concept artist is, um, and even who you are. I, I like I I don't even feel like you can get take credit for who you are as a person. It's like a product of genetics, right, yeah. Uh, a product of who your parents were, a product of all these events. Um, so it's like to say like I accomplished something. I don't. I don't honestly know what that means. You accomplish something as someone who was born into can- a Canadian society, uh, someone who like didn't have parents who had diseases mm-hmm. like like AIDS. Like you weren't born in Africa. Okay, I can't take credit for that. You aren't totally incompetent. You're 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 mostly incompetent, but not totally incompetent. Can you take credit for that? Can you take credit for that? Um, I don't know. Like I don't. I don't believe really in free will, and so it's hard for me to take credit for things and the only reason i did take a lot of credit or appear to is because i thought that that was the exercise that was necessary to build the company you know in terms of like if i was to go now and stop say whatever last taxi is a success it's not i leave whichever way it goes Mm -hmm. and i make a tv show and it's like you'd hope that 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 creative translates Mm -hmm. but i don't know i think i think if you make a successful game and you just say i made this you know, let, let, let the thing live and be its own thing. Right, right, right. So, um, moving from clandestine to last taxi, I don't know how much you're able to, to talk about last taxi, Yep. but can you sort of talk about how things have changed from clandestine and going through those experience, those negative experiences as you describe them Yeah. and how you try and, change the the sort of vibe in a positive direction based on what you learned well and like even like what is what is I, if you can talk about what last taxi is um in general as a concept yeah um well as a concept it's it's ostensibly or in appearance but not really about the last human taxi driver in the automated future um it's ultimately about uh trying to use conversations okay well okay so for one thing like when we made clandestine we tried to make this really heady story i had a huge universe bible and we ultimately ended up with very little like less than a percentage of what was planned like the prologue of the prologue is what we ultimately (laughs) released right um and and danielle and me were like we're supposed to be storytellers we we didn't tell a good story and we hardly got any story out the next game this was before we really knew the concept of it at all the next game has to be filled with story and so that's where it's you know through us and collaborating with other people on our team the idea of passengers kind of you know each passenger can be its own person its own story and you can look at things like the future automation environmental degradation through a wide variety of perspectives you know you can have excuse me you can have like a tech tycoon get into your taxi Mm -hmm. and you can have a refugee with with nothing getting in your taxi and you can talk to them both and, and the game doesn't try to make judgments about what future is good or what future is bad it presents a very hostile world you know it's uh, a world where there is a lot of uh, socioeconomic um like you know uh, class division uh where the environment has gone completely ape shit and uh and you might even be the last city that anybody knows it's a terrible it's not a great city to live in but um when there's few else around then the one that you see is the beacon of hope um and through that general like layered context i, I don't actually want to say what the story is there is a real right, story in it and i kind of want it to be a surprise <laughs> um because uh it involves a type of character that isn't common in the game and i don't mean that from a class or race perspective right um though there is that in the game too but um but the engine of the story i think is fairly novel um but you essentially like through being a taxi driver and through events that happen early in the game get driven down this rabbit hole of really seeing deep into the society and needing to make choices about what what is the you know op- 
well, what future do you want? You can take greedy paths and you can take, I mean, we're saying all this stuff and remembering from clandestine, it's like, I shouldn't say anything about any features because who the hell knows what's going to ship. But, um, all to that, my next question was going to be, how do you stop yourself from falling into the same sort of trap that you had with clandestine with over, over promising sort of, and under delivering? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I haven't said too much about the game and if my social media doesn't make any right. grand claims, um, uh, I'm more confident than I otherwise would be because we are basically at a vertical slice very soon, and uh, and it's not garbage. Like I don't I don't know that it's good. I don't think I'm the one to evaluate it. There's certainly things in it that are good, um, and so I, I feel like we're going to ship something, and it will be better than anything I've shipped before. Mm-hmm. But whatever that means. Um, but I mean, r- really, uh, you know, it's about an exploration of the future, an exploration of humanity exploration of technology through many conversations and through going down this sort of rabbit hole uh that puts a lowly taxi driver at the center of action in a in a way that doesn't involve guns and explosions just talking what's more human really than conversation uh and that's partly why it's a conversation game um you know is a conversation with the robot especially if it's not sentient is it really a real conversation I don't know, but with a taxi driver it is. But in terms of team, it's like, it's about fit. It's about more like, you know, you have to make sure as much as you can, because you never really know what your employees or your colleagues are thinking. Uh, But making an environment that is positive and making an environment where people enjoy contributing, like they have to like what they're doing essentially and finding people who fit both together in terms of being able to work together is very hard and also finding people who um well and just creating an environment where people feel sort of safe and feel um open and i try to create an environment where people challenge me i don't know how successful i am at that but i'm certainly want to be challenged uh by my own team right um so aside from morale was the word i was looking for earlier like positive morale Mm -hmm. is probably the key thing and trying to make sure everyone is happy uh like their talent is a given if they're not talented they don't like you get rid of them but assuming that they're sufficiently have something to offer then if there's morale and team cohesion then i think you could be doing a lot worse right 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 I th- and i believe that you touched on this um earlier in the conversation you don't just make games like you and, and uh, your wife have done a whole litany of projects mm-hmm. Because one thing that I think that is interesting or that I appreciate about this is there's more to people than the things that they're known for. So, again, like you're potentially known for Clandestine, Last Taxi, and some of the other things that we mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. What are some of the more artistically driven things? Not to say that the things that you have done aren't artistically driven, but that is kind of like projects that are for you i don't know if that's a good way to describe mm-hmm. it i mean they're all for me right well okay client work's not for me i don't do a lot of client work but none of that stuff usually there's something in there for me either something i want to learn or a uh, technology i want to just play with on somebody else's money but like anything we do that's like a zen fry thing they, it all honestly comes from the same place like okay. we created the company to f- fortify creative freedom like that was the point it was like we need a place where we can make stuff and and have it be protected and also me and my wife danielle collaborate a lot and we needed a place where we could sign off as each of us equally right you know like like a core king game of danielle whatever it's like it's zen fry it's both of us um and uh so i don't know but i mean like in terms of innovation too like concepts of innovation like when you work in AR and VR, it's sort of like a, a given, although I don't believe that to be true, that you're innovating. But, like, I feel like I always have done innovative projects, even when mm. it was just written. You know, there's new things to explore in text. There's new characters or ideas to explore. A philosopher can be innovative right. in his thinking. Um, so I think I always try to come up at things with some level of innovation. But it always comes from, like, you know, I just become drunkly in love with some idea that you know, at least at the time seems worth sacrificing X number of years of your life to accomplish. So you, so you treat like all everything that you work on in kind of the same 
with the same um, uh, with the same perspective. Like none of the uh, like, for example, uh, you I don't know what it's called the the project that you worked that uh, you and Daniel worked on with the papers. Um, what is like that a, one called? animation? The animation one. Infinite struggles. Or... Infinite struggles. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you look at that project differently as you look at clandestine and last taxi? Is essentially what I'm trying they to get. They come at. from. They come from the same part of your heart, but I but they're not the same. Like I do think, I do think clandestine was my feeble attempt to make something that was like had the like. I always want to have interesting ideas in my games, and that was my attempt to put it in a commercial casing. And I think Last Taxi may well be more commercially successful, but. It's definitely weaning more in the opposite direction of just directly exploring interesting ideas um, and trying to find that balance. Like you, you want your voice to be heard, but you want to say interesting novel things. Mm. And so you have to try to package your words in a digestible format. Um, and so that was an attempt to be a little bit more commercial. The art style, I think, kind of shows that. And the new one is a are little... You, are you referring to... Clandestine. Clandestine. Um, but ultimately, they're all there... Uh, trying to say something they're all from the heart uh infinite struggles is what you know, like what is infinite struggles so infinite struggles infinite struggles well if it's mostly people who know video games i'm going to try to so there's a genre of experimental cinema not to sound too pretentious too uh quite too late yeah <laughs> called motion paintings uh and it's basically just like sometimes it's just shapes and abstract things but essentially it's you know taking in emotion through the like kinetic movement of image and sound okay right. Ooh, super pretentious um all right well um i can't go that abstract like like infinite struggles is something that is as abstract as i can go but essentially my goal was to take a digital picture frame and come up with a format of storytelling that was suited for the digital picture frame like i, I kind of don't believe that like some mediums are art like uh, daniel and me both work with an organization called forum art center and they teach like conventional art classes okay painting and, th and in there there's a friction just like there's a friction with the game industry and how they feel about filmmakers or anything else there's a friction of what is and isn't art and to me it's like like you can make art out of toilet paper and you can make garbage on a canvas you know, the medium does not determine if it's if it's art or if it's not art. So for this case, I wanted to tell a story that was in a digital picture frame. Digital picture frames have always been seen as this sort of stupid, tacky thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would they're say so. Yeah. They're, they're very tacky. But and I felt like they're underutilized. It's like like the, the, the use case that they were designed for was kind of gross. Like like have these have this bright light f rotating through pictures of your family or whatever. I never really liked it, but I thought that there was a potential you know, paintings have a place in a gallery. Film has a place in a cinema. Is there a way that you can create a format of film that fits on a digital picture frame? And it changes the structure of the story. Because when you put something in an art gallery, I, well, not everyone believes this because people do just put films in art galleries sometimes, but I think the work has to be approachable at any moment. Like, the, it's, like you can make a linear piece of content, but if you just put a film like a James Bond movie in an art gallery someone walks in, or maybe something more confusing like the matrix they walk or memento walk in 30 minutes in you've got no clue what's going on because it's it's structured in a way that requires the plot to, to follow a certain way so if you want to be in an art gallery in my opinion even if it's a video product it needs to allow every moment to be an entry point and every moment to be an exit point and so we tried to structure this story and the story is ultimately about about not finding love like in or, or trying to achieve okay. love that the infinite struggle is you reach out to the world and it's very hard to make a connection and the character in the story the main character if there is one is constantly undermined in their attempt to reach a specific character and actually form a relationship that's what the thing's about and it's like but how do you tell that story in a gallery format where people can enter it and exit it at any point um and also if you're going to do a digital picture frame this is where it gets I'm not going to talk about this too long. This is where it gets super, like, whatever you call it, esoteric uh, or uh, artsy-fartsy. Since it was on a digital picture frame, we tried to create organic and non-organic elements. You know, like we, f we shot video 
then printed it to make it organic and painted it, which is organic, and then redigitized it. So it's a digital. Eh, right. Doesn't, okay, yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. But it meant a lot <laughs> to us. And it, and that still, that experiment had some interesting outputs. Like, because you really painted paper and you didn't paint it digitally, the weight of the paint on cheap paper, like, wrinkled. And so there's these weird, like, distortions and stuff that are, are uh, like, experimental cinema nerds get a, would get a kick out of. And I personally get a kick out of. You're like, that took five times the effort. But look at how the paper got <laughs> kind of slightly destroyed. Um, and, and I consider that to be innovative, as innovative as anything else in, in terms of being innovative, because I haven't seen other people do it. You, t- you take a medium, digital picture frames, and you create a format or a story or a piece of content that is not like anything somebody has done with that. Um, uh, but, you know. Uh, I, I think that's... Uh, and that's exactly the reason why i wanted to bring up some of those projects uh like uh, infinite struggles that are outside of games and in more technology driven things um because it i feel from my perspective it offers something different that i can get out of it that i wouldn't be able to get out of uh something like clandestine or a potential i guess i won't know but uh, last taxi yeah um and I feel like that's really valuable and, and people can grab on to different things and, and how you achieve everything that you've talked about with infinite struggles and, and how it relates to all the different kind of projects that you're working on. I just and find people it really can see it on uh, the, the we recut it for, for cinema because uh, there's way more film festivals and there is art galleries in right. terms of uh, and people can see the, see it online if they if they if they care enough. Um, where on my, can on they, my website, where they can find like zenfry.com, go to projects, okay. go to finding for struggles. Uh, and it is very different. Uh, and it was like, you know, for us, it was the most successful thing we had done up to that point. It played at festivals around Canada and stuff. But um, the thing we did right before Clandestine, actually the funding of Clandestine like ruined my ability to like properly market this because uh, it was an anthology of written and visual works called War Paint where we, we basically had international authors. And some of these, like, were people who were nominated for, like, if this means anything to people who read the Man Booker Prize or have won, like, prestigious CBC awards. Like, we... some It's very interesting uh, if you offer to publish people's work in, in a field that isn't as monetized talent-wise as, as mm-hmm. video games. You know, it's hard to get a programmer to work for free, but to get an, a writer to contribute work... Not necessarily for free, but for like in this very indie spirit, it's a little bit easier. At least I found it easier. And it was just a book of of writings and paintings that people had given to us. Um, and then the very next thing we did was clandestine. You know, so I don't know that you can get more far apart, really. I'm curious. Ultimately, when you kind of look back at everything, I know there's a, an infinite amount of things that we haven't sort of discussed. But if you can include those, all those things that we haven't discussed, along with clandestine, along with war paint, uh, and all these things, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way? Hmm. So, uh, lessons in regards to what? That's a good question. Yeah, and I don't necessarily mean to turn it around, but it's no, like. Sorry. I've learned a lot of things. And. Uh, or what were the biggest things that kind of stick out to you like for example um i've had certain conversations with different people that kind of stuck out to me and people that have uh, influential people to me and they kind of i've i grab on to some of those things Mm -hmm. i don't know if you have any of those kind of experiences so just like i don't really think my identity is all that valuable i don't really (laughs) uh, but there is works i love you know uh and there are some. It's a perfect example, yeah. Well, there and there's some filmmakers who, for instance, uh, you know, I like Stanley Kubrick, and I like, I like a lot of works of Stanley Kubrick, and I like a lot of works of Martin Scorsese. But Stanley Kubrick has made less films, but of the films he's made, a higher percentage of them I like, whereas Scorsese has some duds. I'm not really sure what there is to like ultimately learn. Like I don't, I don't have like a guy. Like my guiding principles aren't related to the industry. It's sort of like. You know, there's basically th- three primary things you should always be striving to do. One is like 
uh, what are they? Well, there's like try to continue and better your own existence, find happiness if you can, and and and, and make a good life for yourself. Um, and that one, which is oddly the thing I thought I was least likely to ever obtain, was any kind of like personal private happiness. Is the thing I've I've most effortlessly found, to be honest. Just stumbled into it more or less, and and uh, and and my life is. Like, I don't know. It's just extremely happy. And again, I can't take credit for it. It's like, I don't know. You meet the people you meet. You fall for the people you fall. You make the decisions together that you make. And you're happy with those decisions or you're not. I don't know. Right, right. Then the second stage is short of everything else, you need to continue, like make sure the species survives. Because Shakespeare doesn't mean shit to a squirrel. And it probably doesn't mean anything to an alien. You know, maybe they'll like it. Maybe they won't. It really, everything's value is derived by the species itself and the cultures that we've derived mm -hmm. so really everything that humanity does in my opinion is worth nothing if humanity isn't involved in the future so that comes down to like i really really uh am concerned with climate change i've only gotten a car very very recently uh, i live in a house smaller than i probably need to and uh, i try to be pretty austere for the most part um and, and I think very critically about all these little micro decisions. One, not because I think my micro decisions ultimately matter on a macro level of 7 billion people, but I can die without the sin of saying there's more I could do personally. Okay, yeah. That's part of it, right? Right. I don't drive around, no offense, in a Hummer <laughs> yeah. because yeah. how can I, with good conscience, damn the world that's being destroyed as I take an active part in destroying it? And obviously, I live in a country that is heavily consuming of energy right so i'm i'm like already like fraught with that but um but either way like whatever that means have children develop good children do things with your life that minimally don't destroy things and hopefully make things like like continue on the species and if things go bad enough we shouldn't probably be making video games anymore if it gets bad enough if right. if, if if we're at a point of like cataclysm and we're sitting here being like well I, but i love mario it's a little bit but the third thing, which is where art more comes in and where more ideas come in, is you assuming you can get those first two things, your own happiness, then the, the, the survival of the species. I also think that the, the final thing is you have to focus on making the species as good as possible. So it's like, you know, like um, using technology to improve ourselves, coming up with better you know, I think we're delusional if we think we have the best political model or the best economic model. There's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, should humans integrate with machines? Uh, should we go to Mars? I think we probably, probably should like extend into the universe. But like basically everything I do, I try to do in those contexts. Will it make me happier? Is it at least minimizing the harm to the rest of the species and planet? Right. And hopefully you're instilling a message in your work that tries to meet the third criteria, which is the hardest criteria, which is like improving the species. It's very lofty. And you honestly can't know if you're doing it or not unless you're, again, curing cancer. But who knows? Curing cancer increases the population, which might cause, you know, you never know. I was actually listening to J Dave Chappelle's special on Netflix, and he talked about how... Um, this black woman was killed and it was a tragedy to most people but it led to the movement that ultimately gained like allowed civil rights to take off and his point with that story was you literally don't know what bad thing what the outcomes will be or what good things uh will come of like you know you might make a good gesture and it seems ostensibly good and it ultimately is destructive so the the barrier of saying you'd like to do something that improves the species is impossible no this the people who make social media probably at least initially had good intentions and maybe they still do but is it ultimately a good thing you don't know right. so it's really hard to meet that banner but i think you have to try and like we're lucky we're making video games man like like the amount of privilege that is the amount of fortune you have to even be able to make video games and then in our case make games that are like of my own volition and my own ideas um i think that that shouldn't reduce your obligation to make what you do important and have a positive effect i think it increases it 
Right, 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 right. Right? And yes, I would say clandestine, as it is in the package it is, is an atrocious example of that because it doesn't do anything, really, um, in terms of storytelling, in terms of narrative. I'm hoping Last Taxi hits a little bit closer, um, but I'm constantly like, I only have the skill sets I have. I cannot be a physicist, you know? But within the realms, I can be capable. I'm constantly questioning, is this the path that is the best in terms of, you know, meeting those three requirements? And I have no idea. Um, well, in, in closing here, I, I'm i also kind of curious. I, I Generally, I pose this question to most people, and I was particularly interested to see how you would answer it. <laughs> Um, when you look back on your life and when it's all said and done, what would you like to have been said about your life? Well, I thought you were going to ask me the Pearly Gates question, but I was going to, (laughs) which which I have, I've thought about that one quite a bit, but essentially um, it's the same question. Well, they're, my answers are totally different, but in terms of what do I want said about me? Hmm. I don't, you can answer the Pearly Gates question. Well, I'll just answer (laughs) both, but in terms of. What do I want said about me? I don't know. Are you, do you, is there any control over it? Like, so Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Right. What can be said of him? He's done good. He's done bad. I don't know. And, and, and like, will the weight of his slave ownership slowly overtake the weight of his writing the, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, participating in that? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, it changes. I honestly don't think there's any reason to be specifically remembered i think we're an organism we're literally the same thing like we're all the same thing we're like little processing units of a giant organism planet earth and the people in it and i don't specifically need to be remembered or want to be remembered hopefully hopefully there's a a a, a piece of content i make that has some traction and even if it's not remembered you know does a little bit to swerve people in one direction or another Mm -hmm. uh the point i the point of last taxi isn't to judge or, 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 or preach what future we should have, but to ensure that people are adequately considering what we're approaching. Because there's no point, you know, we stumble into the future generally, almost always. Technology Im- is imposed on us. iPhones become popular and we thought we were going to get the Jetson cars, you know. Um, but people need to just think about the future. Everyone needs to think about the future. Um, but really, if a piece of work has an impact that lasts, that's more than... I could possibly ask for um and short of that if a concept or an idea that is embedded in a piece of work sort of like permeates through you know, cultural natural selection you know uh then that's fine i mean what what is cory king you know you're never gonna know who i am i don't even know who i am <laughs> so what's the point of remembering it you know if there is no point the work is there to be better than you and to and and it's there to have a coherent package you know there's like i'm not no your mind's not coherent um in terms of the pearly gates so there's two things one if you get to the pearly gates like i'm a atheist agnostic guy but if you get the pearly gates and it's revealed that god's there um well for one uh i would thank him probably uh because um i i enjoy life you know, I think about this when I think about when I got over sort of like resenting my childhood. You think your parents are the only parents that they could be. Like like literally, like you could have the most terrible parents ever, but it took those two specific people at that specific time to create you. So when you damn those people, you're damning your own existence. You don't have an option to have been born into royalty. Right. You only have the, you're literally was, it was not existing at all or existing in the circumstances that you exist in. So you thank them because uh, I think that on the net, especially as I get older and I get more happiness in my life, that this was more than well worth it. And, and, uh, and I appreciate that. The other thing is assuming he is uh, omnipotent and omnipresent, I would, I would if either plead if he's not on side with this or, 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 or be appreciative of the fact that if he is truly omnipotent, which I don't think God has to be omnipotent right. necessarily, that he hopefully being omnipotent omnipresent understands from my own perspective all the decisions i've made right so if if you know i shouldn't be damned for non-belief because if he really understood the context in which i came to my non-belief 
he would understand that I considered it deeply and seriously, and that he was the one that created the construct that, given my person, would come to that decision. Ah, okay. So it's his fault that right. I don't believe, ultimately, since he's so damn powerful. <laughs> um, but I actually think God, like, I was thinking about this recently. AI, I think, tells us that gods can be inferior to their creations. Say we, cr say humans create an artificial intelligence that supersedes us. We are then inferior gods. And in fact, all of right, nature, yeah. all of nature is actually derived of inferior gods. If you go with the evolution, this is some random mechanism that like we started as a single celled organism. So everything was inferior to the, to the new thing, or at least, right. Uh, so it, it's quite possible. God's inferior. He's some kid who like, got an F on his science experiment because he created the most degenerate bunch of people you could ever possibly I imagine. Like that analogy. Um, but, you know, I would plead with him to be rational if he's not rational and say, you know, if you saw life from my perspective, you would make the same choices. And if he is rational, I would say, thank you for being rational and not smiting me for the rest of time because, uh, because I've you know, gotten some bad information because <laughs> I didn't feel there was adequate information. Um, and that's, that's what I would do for that. Well, that's an answer if I've ever heard one. <laughs> it's multi-pronged and unnecessarily verbose. <laughs> um, but I, I, re I really appreciate this entire conversation. Uh, I mean, I've had plenty of opportunities to talk to you, um, but there's something different about when you just sit down with someone and you sort of cut through all the, like... The inane details. So I wanted to thank you sure. for your time. Thank you. Um, is there anywhere like online you mentioned uh, Zenfry? You have a website. Yeah, people can find you and your projects. Yeah, Zenfry.com. I mean, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, I'm personally becoming less inclined towards those things. I don't even have Facebook anymore. But uh, certainly, our company still has a presence on on Instagram and, and things like that. And and I'd like to thank you as well. And and my main hope, excuse me, is I oh, hope is I that. hope I hope people get through the early part of this conversation. Not because it wasn't maybe in the context of outside of Winnipeg that conversation yeah. didn't really matter. In the context of Winnipeg, maybe it was important. But I think the angels of my better nature were more better or were more uh, positively manifest on the second half of this conversation. Yes, uh, yeah, I would agree. And, and I'm hoping that people get through the, you know bitching and moaning or whatever they want to call it of the opening yeah. and whatever they could still hate me after it. i don't care <laughs> i honestly don't care like i'm happy and uh that's that's more than half the battle of life i think great um well again i want to thank you for your time um uh as well this podcast is uh by lar in in by no small means um possible thanks to daniel bergman who does all of the sort of editing uh, the video editing, audio editing, he's been super great. So I just wanted to shout him out again. Um, uh, Dan Blair from Bitspace Development. Uh, I've, through the course of this entire conversation series, I've been able to get access to all kinds of different equipment. Um, and this chair is a Zenfry chair, though. I got to tell you. <laughs> Zenfry chair. There you go. And this table, too. <laughs> um, but... All these people coming together to contribute to what I like to steer as a community podcast. I know I'm on all of them and I'm the host, quote unquote. But I appreciate that I have all these unique people coming on, all these different people helping me and supporting, growing the community into kind of like a closer, tight-knit group of people. Um, so with that, uh, I don't think I'm missing... Oh, I... I caught myself. Um, this podcast is also now on, or it has always been on pretty much every major podcast platform. We have our website, interactiveindies.com. Um, I guess if you want to find anything that I do, um, Hyperscope on Twitter is a great place to go to. Um, and then a good community site would be pegjam.com. And... IGDA Winnipeg. If you Google that, you'll find pretty much all of the community things uh, that is going on in Winnipeg. So, thank you again, Corey. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.